the apology is sort of the most literary of the dialogues that we're reading in the sense that well not the most literary but the least philosophical there's not a lot of direct philosophy but uh it is good to read well for lots of reasons but the main reason we're reading it is that uh it's kind of like it's like about philosophy in a lot of ways and the philosophical life and so even though there's not a lot of direct philosophy it's a really good dialogue to read in an introductory philosophy class. So because it's got less philosophy than normal, uh, and also because it's the most literary, I guess, of the dialogues we're reading, that well, this and the symposium, but uh, because it's pretty literary, uh, it's good to get like a lot of background for this one. Well, not a lot, but some. Th this lecture is background. So first, Aristophanes and Clouds. So we've seen Aristophanes, he was in the symposium. He was a comic playwright, so he wrote comedies in ancient Athens. He was a very popular one. Some of his plays survive, including Clouds, which is one of his good ones. Clouds is a play about uh, philosophers, specifically one philosopher named Socrates, who's kind of a joke. He walks around with his head in the clouds. This is uh, where the name of the play comes from, and he sort of studies the heavens, but he's very bad at it. He comes up with terrible explanations for everything. He kind of doesn't understand things that happen uh, on the ground. He doesn't understand society or anything like this. He has a student who he takes on and he convinces his student to do all sorts of terrible things, rebel against his father, uh, and just treat his family terribly. And so Socrates is really not a great guy in the clouds. Uh, this has no, well, this has very little relation to historical Socrates. So uh, historical Socrates did not study uh, the heavens or anything like this. And this is important because all of the pre-Socratic philosophers, so what was philosophy in Athens like and what was philosophy in ancient Greece like before Socrates came along? Mostly it was what we would today call science. So they were mostly interested in figuring out things like why does rain come from clouds? Why does thunder happen? Why do earthquakes happen? What is everything made of? Well, I sorry, I shouldn't have made it up. It's like science. They, they studied lots of things. They were interested in how did the universe begin? What is time? What is everything made of? Uh, we have people like Democritus who uh, proposes that everything is made of small atoms, uh, which turns out to be uh, correct. And then we have people like Thales who proposes that everything is made of water, which turns out to be incorrect. And so uh, this is what a lot of the philosophers were up to in ancient Athens before Socrates. Socrates was so important and so uh, distinct in his approach that we kind of we lump all the s philosophers before Socrates into the group of the pre-Socratics. And uh, what the pre-Socratics were concerned with is a lot of the stuff that Aristophanes is parodying in the clouds. So he picks the name Socrates for his philosopher, but really... Uh, to the extent that was anybody, you know, that's somebody like Thales or Anaximander or one of these pre-Socratic philosophers. So, you know, a little unfair, but uh, it's, <laughs> it seems to have had maybe bad effects because as one of the footnotes in uh, the dialogue will point out, a lot of Athenians who may not have known Socrates personally may have gotten the impression from seeing this play, which was a very popular play, uh, that Socrates went around... Uh, sort of corrupting the youth into rebelling against their families and wasting his time on ridiculous studies that didn't make any sense. So uh, Aristophanes may have uh, misled people a little bit about Socrates, and we'll see how that plays out in the Apology. If you think back to the initial lecture about Plato, I talked about Alcibiades and the 30 tyrants and the Peloponnesian War and Athens and Sparta. Two other relevant uh, Athenians who will also be pointed out in the footnotes of the Apology are Critias and Charmides. These were two of the 30 tyrants, so uh, not particularly great. They were also associated with Socrates. They, along with Plato, uh, liked to follow Socrates around. So they were sort of his students, not in the sense that Socrates was actively teaching anything to them. Uh, he didn't set up a school, again, anything like that. But uh, they were kind of associated with Socrates. They were in the Socrates gang. Uh, they don't show up in the symposium the way Alcibiades did and the way Aristophanes did, by the way. 
uh, but they, it, I'm sure there were many other symposiums where Critias and or Charmides were there along with Socrates. So uh, Socrates was kind of in the minds of the Athenians at this point. So this is only like five years after the 30 tyrants, including Critias and Charmides. So Socrates is kind of associated with bad people. Um, does this come to the forefront in the Apology? Not so much, but it is in the background, very much in the background. And then finally, more broadly, so the, the Apology is uh, Socrates giving a speech at his trial, and this is how Athenian trials worked. You would have prosecution done not by the government. The government didn't have a prosecution arm. Rather, you would have charges brought by sort of the aggrieved party, or if the aggrieved party was society, you could have anybody bring charges on behalf of, you know, society. And so there wasn't an official prosecutor. There was just people taking up the mantle of prosecution. And you would have the prosecutors give speeches. These would be very long speeches, maybe like hours long, perhaps. You would have the accused party give a speech. And, you know, there would be some cross-examination, perhaps. Uh, and so you're giving these speeches in defense or uh, against somebody. The accused could hire somebody to give a speech for them, like hire a lawyer, basically. Uh, but that was that was seen as bad form. It was more impressive if you could give your own speech. So there was a big industry of speech writing for these things. The whole the Athenian court speech was basically a genre because uh, quite a bit could be writing on these court cases. So you could lose quite a bit of money uh, in court, or you could be sentenced to like jail or death or exile or something. And so your life could hinge on how this thing goes. And you needed to, you didn't need to, but it was a good idea to give the speech yourself. So you can imagine people sort of making a lot of money uh, being speechwriters, like saying, oh, I can, I can get you off this charge, or I can win you this uh, court case, I can win you this prosecution against the other person. And so uh, Athenians were very well aware of sort of the importance of giving a good court speech and what counted as a good court speech eventually like be, because it was a sort of a genre there were sort of expectations about how the court speech was supposed to go and especially if you were accused or something and if you were facing uh punishment or something it, the general expectation was you were supposed to kind of throw yourself at the mercy of the jury uh you were supposed to say uh, you're make yourself maybe not pitiful, but, you know, cry and put a lot of emotion into it and show how much you had writing on this and say, uh, you know, please don't send me to jail. Like, it's there are mitigating circumstances or something. Like, you, you really want to put a lot of pathos into your speech and really hit people at the, like, emotional level and sort of tug at their hearts. Because, it, thinking back to the first uh, lecture I gave, the context of this is there's hundreds of people here out in the jury um, I think the, the typical number was like 501, and so there were hundreds and hundreds of people shown up, and you would give, be giving these speeches to these huge groups of people, and you were really trying to win over the mob, effectively, and so you were supposed to be, uh, and they were expecting you to try to win them over and give a good speech that would really uh, pull at their hearts. So that's the kind of speech the audience is expecting from Socrates. And he doesn't really give one of those. This is, uh, so I guess I should mention this isn't on the outline. So is this Socrates' speech historically? Eh, I mean, the, the Plato doesn't like anywhere say, here it is, here is the historical speech. And he, he, certainly it was very, very likely Plato was there. If he was not there, lots of people were there and he heard how the thing went. We have two historical accounts. We have two accounts of Socrates' speech. We have this one written by Plato another one written by Xenophon. Xenophon is another student of Socrates. He followed Socrates around. He wrote some Socratic dialogues, just like Plato did. Xenophon is <laughs> not as good a philosopher as Plato, and so his dialogues are uh, not as good, and they're sort of less philosophically uh, interesting. He His version of the Apology is closer to the sort of classic, uh, uh, the, the classic genre. It's less philosophically involved, uh, maybe it's closer to the historical truth, maybe not, hard to tell. Um, Plato is not like claiming here, He, you know, the dialogue just starts, Plato doesn't say, and here we have the 
verbatim speech of Socrates. So it's not clear that Plato is trying to accurately recreate word for word what Socrates said. But on the other hand, unlike all the other Platonic dialogues where like, yeah, maybe it seems like some conversation Socrates had, but of course, kind of, you know, changed into dialogue uh, in, into the form that Plato wrote it down and cleaned up and stuff like that. Some dialogues are like that. So the Euthyphro and the Crito are like that. Other dialogues involve Socrates, but like certainly didn't happen anything like that. So they aren't at all close to the historical Socrates. So the Republic is one we're not reading, but that's that's got Socrates as a character, but not the real Socrates. So unlike the ones that are kind of close to real Socrates, and unlike the ones that are not close to real Socrates, the Apology seems to have like almost no Plato in it. There's no like Platonic philosophy. There's really like not a lot of philosophy at all. It does seem to just be like the sort of speech Socrates would have given. So how accurate is this? Probably in terms of accurately re reporting Socrates, it's maybe as close as we're going to get in the Platonic dialogues, at least. So um, so with that digression out of the way, uh, does Socrates give one of these speeches the Athenians were expecting? I don't know. So is this like a three hour long speech throwing himself before the mercy of the court? I'll let you decide. It's not obviously yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide. And the only thing I'll say is it's certainly not obviously what they were expecting. It's potentially uh, ironic. And what do I mean by ironic? Well, uh, it's sort of confounding their expectations. He's sort of, he knows what they want from him, and he's not giving it to them, perhaps, to some extent. And so uh, this is worth thinking about both in the context of this dialogue, so just to understand what's going on here, it helps to understand what they would have expected to get and what they actually got. And also just Socrates had a kind of reputation for being an ironic guy in general. We're going to see one of the reasons why in this dialogue, because in this dialogue, he's going to claim to know nothing. Like he's, <laughs> I don't know anything. But then he, he's going around as like the most reputed philosopher in ancient Athenian society. So how could he not know anything? So that's a sort of maybe ironic kind of statement when he says, I don't know anything. And just generally, he had a reputation for uh, being this kind of ironic uh, thinker in which he's kind of confounding expectations. And so uh, whether or not and to what extent the apology is an example of Socratic irony, uh, I leave that up to you to sort of think through and discover.